Okay, matches. Uh, we'll back to the fourth panel of this morning. Now we are getting into a more comparative approach between uh, the investment arbitration, uh, the ISSDS arbitration, and commercial arbitration. And I'm very delighted and glad to welcome on the panel first our first speaker, Professor Diego Fernandez Arroyo, and then as a commentator, Professor uh, Patrick Thieffry, both of them mainly linked to Paris, if I see that, but acting from Paris on a worldwide basis. That's all what I want to say on way of introducing you. All further additional information can, as I said before, be found in that leaflet, which we all have. Professor Fernandez Arroyo, you have the floor, please. Thank you very, <coughs> thank you very much, and thank you, Elena and Burkhardt, for the kind invitation. Um, this panel, uh, um, I'm talking uh, under the control of the commentator. Um, will be maybe uh, have different from the previous because, uh, given the title, the organizer um, uh, sent to us, uh, it is not necessarily related to the very discussion about the EU proposal. Uh, for the TTIP. So, uh, as you can uh, read in, in the program, there's differences and similarities between investment and commercial arbitration. So, maybe we are going to move a little bit outside of the previous discussion, even if, uh, at least as far as I am concerned, I will make several references to the, some situations in investment arbitration, and in particular, in the context within the context of uh, the EU proposal. Um, I have a, a general idea about the subject presented in, in the title of, of this last panel of the morning. And that general idea is that commercial arbitration and investment arbitration are without doubt different, but they have the similar requirements of good governance, which are increasingly demanded to investment arbitration, but that do the stand mutatis mutandis, also to commercial arbitration. In the EU proposal, if the EU proposal succeeds, which is far from certain, the new system is likely to spread a strong influence on investment law, and from a broader perspective, on international arbitration, lato sensu. And not necessarily, I am talking about a good, influence. And let me make also a, a disclaimer. The title of this panel uh, speaks about uh, differences and similarities between investment arbitration and commercial arbitration, but all the attendants here know very well that between investment arbitration and commercial arbitration, in the sense of commercial arbitration involving private parties, we find commercial arbitration involving a state party, uh, which from some perspective has more in common with investment arbitration than with commercial arbitration involving private parties. Actually, in several respects, the very presence of a state is more significant than the fact of arbitration rights out of a contract or of a treaty. Furthermore, there are different uh, kinds of investment arbitration. Legal literature and scholars uh, often identify, at, at least implicitly, investment arbitration with exit arbitration. But all know very well that there is a vast room for other kinds of arbit investment arbitration. Uh, investors said treaty arbitration may either take the form of an ad hoc arbitration or be submitted to another institution, which is preferred 
by many uh, councils right now. And on the other hand, there are investment arbitration without investment treaty. Ultimately, treaties and contracts are often mixed by means of umbrella clauses. So this is the disclaimer being made when I talk about commercial arbitration here, I am talking about private arbitration, or arbitration between private parties. And most of the things I'm going to mention related to investment arbitration are also applicable to so-called commercial arbitration involving one state party. And which are the, the differences? Well, there are many differences, and maybe we could speak uh, very long about this, but let me mention uh, a few which are maybe the more significant. Um, the most important one is the uh, dif difference between the, the two kinds of arbitration is the interest at stake. I don't need to elaborate uh, too much on this point. Uh, I think it's clear that investment arbitration deals by definition with uh, public matters, public policy, regula regulatory issues, etc. A second difference is the scope of party autonomy, which is an investment arbitration um, rather smaller because treaties, and in particular when investment arbitration is, is based on treaties, treaties imposes, uh, impose uh, concrete mandatory obligations. And in general, as, as uh, Laurence uh, has pointed out, uh, the application of international law in investment arbitration is always there. And that makes really a difference uh, in comparison with private arbitration. And generally speaking, the state is a very particular litigator. As to the substance, the state keeps always its political attributes, including, including its general lawmaking power in a, in a broad sense. And of course, that is, that is not stopped by the, the reason that the state is involved in an arbitration. And regarding procedure, arbitration involving states tend to be more formal, uh, much less flexible, and much more time consuming because um, different reasons, but in particular complicated decision making process uh, and the intervention of different governmental agencies. And for instance, uh, in uh, arbitration uh, involved, at the beginning of 2014, uh, we were discussing about the calendar, and the council of the state uh, said, well, the hearing must never take place before the second semester of 2017. That in commercial arbitration is not acceptable, and, and maybe arbitrators will uh, withdraw the tribunal, but in in uh, arbitration involving a state is not so strange. Um, and similarly, an another, uh, the last um, difference, what, what was also already mentioned here, some non-pecuniary rem remedies common in commercial arbitration may be shocking when ordered against a state. And I have many examples in mind, but for example, the arbitration PCA, uh, Chevron, Ecuador, is maybe one of the mm, uh, clear in, in this sense. There's some non-pecuniary remedies, at, as for example, to order the, the government of a state to uh, do not enforce a decision taken by a court of that state is maybe too much. Uh, in, in, and <coughs> it is... Mm, regarded as uh, a very hard decision. But go, let's go to the similarities. And, and the similarities, uh, I mm, prefer 
to take them from the perspective of legitimacy requirements. I know that legitimacy was the subject of a, another panel, but let me uh, mention uh, some elements of my view about this and, and why I think that there are similarities between uh, commercial arbitration and investment arbitration. Um, and and the, the very background for uh, this position is the leading role that arbitration uh, has now in the settlement of transnational commercial disputes in the most latitude to sense of meaning. And uh, that is really a matter of fact. It is not clear that the shift from judicial to arbitral adjudication uh, has taken place over the last decades for a vast range of private, public, and mixed disputes. And this omnipresence of arbitration calls for a greater concern about its legitimacy, and I am, uh, and we are uh, uh, experiencing that in the, dis in the current discussion about uh, TTIP. In my view, the, there are three main legitimacy requirements, which are, with all the difference, applicable or should be applicable both to investment arbitration and also to commercial arbitration. Those legitimacy requirements are uh, trans the following, transparency, consistency, and accountability. And maybe because transparency and consistency, uh, the application of uh, transparency and consistency uh, are quite different regarding investment arbitration on the one hand and commercial arbitration on the other hand, I will, uh, I will be dealing in the next minutes uh, uh, on those. Very shortly on transparency and um, with maybe more ideas about consistency. Accountability, I think, is applicable. Or the idea of accountability is very similar on both because it relates to the responsibility of actors of arbitration, including arbitrators, council, institutions, and parties. Um, it, it, coming to transparency, I think we have a conceptual problem in, in the uh, application of the idea with, uh, uh, according to which transparency is also important for commercial arbitration. And maybe, maybe the idea is that uh, when transparency became a, a really a problem or an, uh, an issue for in, in matter of investment arbitration, the assumption was taken in according to which, well, this is a, a an issue only in investment arbitration because uh, a state is a stake and that is nothing to do with arbitration between private parties. I think that was a, a big mistake and not only a mistake, that was a, a, a serious misunderstanding of the reality going on uh, 20, already 20 years ago. And one of the elements to say that is that, um, uh, of course, in, in some fields where the public interest it, uh, is at stake, and in particular investment arbitration, the tendency towards transparency uh, has progressively prevailed. We can say that now transparency is the paradigm uh, in, 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 in investment arbitration. Uh, in, in commercial arbitration, we can see the transformation of confidentiality. 20 years ago, uh, everybody considered that uh, transparency was an essential element of uh, arbitration. Now we see that nobody seriously uh, takes uh, confidentiality as an essential element of arbitration. Now, confidentiality in commercial arbitration, it is a matter of negotiation. And 
all institutions recommend, if you want transparency for your arbitration, put it in the, in the clause, put it in the, in the, in the agreement. O otherwise, you see this risk that that commercial arbitration will not be confidential as you probably uh, wish. And there are, I, I will not mention all the, 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 the recommendations on this sense, even the, the report on, international, on, on transparency made by the uh, International Law Association in 2010 with a specific explanation why. And let me say uh, uh, just a, one more word. Uh, the fact is that in, in France, which is, uh, nobody doubts that it is a friendly jurisdiction for arbitration, uh, in, in the current uh, arbitration law of France, uh, confidentiality is no longer a requirement for international arbitration. It's a requirement for internal, domestic arbitration, but not for international arbitration. Um, there are other things that I am open to the discussion for that. And about uh, consistency, just, I had two minutes more. Um, Three, thank you very much. That's very generous. The use of, of, pre of precedent is, uh, is becoming a, a common feature for all flavors of international courts and tribunals. And arbitral tribunals are no exception to it. Uh, whenever arbitrators are able to overcome the obstacles embodied by the lack of access to other arbitral awards, basing their decision upon previous awards comes almost naturally. In fact, this behavior is clearly perceptible within the framework of investment, and not only investment, sport arbitration, fields in which transparency is the rule. However, secrecy is not the only barrier to the creation of a system of arbitral case law. There is another obstacle of conceptual nature, Arbitration is traditionally conceived as a dispute settlement mechanism that embodies justice dispensed by tribunal especially appointed in order to settle a particular dispute outside uh, the reach of uh, hierarchically organized jurisdiction and regardless of all other arbitral tribunals. And standing from this uh, ground, it may be difficult to argue that there is a doctrine of precedent in arbitration. And, and Really, I think that we can accept that the, there is nothing like a status disease doctrine in any kind of arbitration. I think that is not a matter of discussion. That I am talking about here is a, a, um, a kind of persuasive um, de facto jurisprudence, which is particularly the case already in investment arbitration and in other areas, uh, specialized areas, and I already mentioned sport arbitration. And the fundamental reason to claim for the development of a precedent doctrine uh, in general in arbitration is the prevailing character of transnational arbitration as a dispute, dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, accordingly, it is apparent that the traditional view of individual arbitration proceedings constituting isolated portions of reality uh, and concerning only the parties and the arbitrators involved is no longer admissible. Since many among the most important transnational disputes, both by quantum and by quality, are settled by means of arbitration, the very functioning of this mechanism and the outcome of disputes submitted to it become relevant for all states, international organizations, civil society, lawyers, economic actors in general, and all are interested in the manner and reasons that arbitral decisions are taken. And many avenues have been um, proposed to reach some kind of consistency. And the two taken by the EU proposal are, um, are not new. Uh, in particular, the official uh, binding interpretation uh, that is 
quite known. And also in commercial arbitration, for example, the Mercosur has adopted an, a declar an interpretative meaning of the agreements on commercial arbitration of the Mercosur, and saying in a particular rule in Article 10 of the Mercosur Agreement on Commercial Arbitration must be interpreted in this kind. So, and mm, in, in a matter of non-binding uh, interpretation, I think the uh, recommendations made by UNCITRAL for the in matter of the in, uh, interpretation of the New York Convention, that's more or less the same thing. The, the difference is the binding character or not. And that is not a problem to extend that possibility to commercial arbitration. Uh, the problem is the, 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 the means we use to impose those decisions and the timing to impose those decisions, even to arbitrations already uh, ongoing. And the other uh, aspect that was already Discuss, discuss here, and I'm open to, to debate about it, it is the, the, the possibility of an, an appeal mechanism. And I think the appeal mechanism is maybe not, maybe in, in the way has been drafted, but the appeal mechanism it may be the, the, the best contribution uh, of the EU proposal. We needed something to have uh, um, a, a mechanism to rich consistency more than in the progressive manner currently made by uh, arbitral tribunals. And, but that is also not necessarily uh, exclusive for investment arbitration. There are already several proposals of that kind uh, in international arbitration. And even for those who don't uh, believe uh, so much in new bodies, I think it's maybe a requirement that we need to take seriously. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Professor Tefi, Jeffrey, you have the floor for your comments, please. Yes, thank you very much. Let me first thank very much the organizers for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure and, and an honor. Um, Diego Fernandez Arroyo brilliantly uh, demonstrated that uh, there may not be as much uh, a difference between investment and commercial arbitration as one would might have expected um, at first sight. Uh, and that there are three main reasons for that. Uh, the, the need for consistency, transparency, and accountability. I think that's uh, very convincing. Actually, I could just take it as a uh, uh, given and, uh, and, and, and stop there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to, to sign on this. Um, this is all the more uh, easy for me that I didn't have to research the uh, uh, tons of uh, scholarly articles uh, that have been published on whether there is a precedential value in arbitration because there was a, a brilliant PhD thesis uh, uh, presented in Geneva last year, in 2014, uh, and which uh, provides uh, a, a, an entire recapitulation of uh, everything that has been said and written on, on the topic. And so I use that extensively. Uh, let me cite uh, the, the, the author, uh, because she deserves this, Dolores Bentolila. Uh, it is a, uh, a, at least a, a, a collection of uh, 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 what has been uh, 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 said and written on, on, on the matter. Uh, her, her thesis was called Arbitrators as Lawmakers, the creation of general rules through consistent arbitral decision-making uh, in international commercial and investment arbitration. Um, I would say that both uh, uh, Diego and, and, and that thesis uh, clearly uh, rule out any possibility of a star stare decisis uh, rule, but I'm not too surprised about that because having practiced in the US myself, I've never really found it uh, elsewhere than in uh, low, low schools and, and books. Um, La jurisprudence constante, well, as a practitioner of arbitration, I, I see it because it's, it's, it's invoked before me all the time. And, and so that's, uh, that's more, 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 more challenging a little bit. Um, coming back to, to, to that thesis, and I'm not going to refer to it anymore afterwards, 
uh, uh, there's a footnote in there that lists 24 uh, pieces uh, uh, concurring to the fact that the vast majority of scholars assert that past arbitral decisions do play a role in international arbitration in varying degrees. Uh, more or less, the idea is that uh, lawyers, counsel, uh, 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 tend to uh, inspire, take inspiration from prior awards, and then uh, arbitrators tend to um, look at past awards to, uh, to see uh, uh, what's been said so far. Now, the problem for one who is uh, called upon to uh, a comment and, and, and maybe try and disagree with Professor Arroyo is that that's not so far, I have no help, because uh, the, the thesis in question does not really distinguish commercial and, and investment arbitration, and even says that the consistencies found uh, exist both in commercial and investment arbitration, whether it uh, can be referred to as a soft or de facto uh, doctrine of precedent or jurisprudence constante or jurisprudence arbitrale. She doesn't really draw a line between the two in this respect, so I'm at a loss and I don't have much to... to, 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 to to refer to. Uh, from an ontological point of view, it seems to be uh, like generally accepted that exceed or, or investment arbitration tends to have more of a precedential uh, uh, value or, or the, next, the, next, the, 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 the next tribunals more uh, easily refer to past awards. And uh, some commentators uh, relying on, on um, extensive research works of uh, uh, people like Gabriel kaufmann koller or Christopher Sepala in the FIDIC area, uh, which are presumably people who have looked into the matters, tend to say that uh, commercial arbitration is at the, quote, opposite extreme of the spectrum insofar as the presidential value of our awards is concerned. Now, clearly, within the next 11 minutes, uh, that are left at the end of the morning. You're all uh, uh, anxious that I, I close and, 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 and be able to uh, go to lunch. Uh, I'm not going to uh, uh, recapitulate or even try to update or have a different uh, approach on all these uh, major works that have been done. I just will very modestly propose a different and much simpler uh, analytical grid and look at the procedural elements of the matter and the substantive elements of the matter and try and see if I can disagree or not with Diego, and I'm sure I will not be able to do so, but let's try it. Five minutes on each. Procedural elements of the matter. Uh, procedural elements, the procedural relationship, and the arbitral process. The procedural relationship. The arbitration agreement, the nature of the parties. How about the arbitration agreement? That's where there is the most difference. We have a treaty on the one hand, or an investment contract with an umbrella clause. This is very different, of course, yes, of course. Uh, yet, when an arbitral tribunal, and there are many arbitrators in the room, they will understand me, uh, when an arbitral tribunal is uh, considering his own jurisdiction under the competence-competence principle, is really, does it really feel that he's at, at freedom to innovate or, or imagine? Or, no way. There is a strong review, uh, either by the uh, Article 52 exit treaty uh, ad hoc uh, committees or by the uh, 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 courts of the uh, place of uh, the arbitration in commercial arbitration. And there I would suggest that we don't have any uh, flexibility because the rule is going to make a full review. Um, now, at the same time, coming at the question from a different point of view, uh, is, is there any uh, jurisprudence with respect to jurisdiction? Oh, you bet, the Salini test. Oh, it is just as much challenged and criticized as it is used. <laughs> That's very interesting. What is an investment? That's the basis of uh, investment treaty uh, jurisdiction. The Salini test. Uh, how about uh, commercial arbitration? Well, let me just say a few words here. Severability of the arbitration clause. The group of companies doctrine. The Ostapel principle. Do arbitrators look at past awards when the, the lawyers, the counsel, Submit them to you? Of course they do. Um, and, uh, well, of course, that's not always true. If you're sitting in, uh, in Switzerland 
And uh, the Article 177, Paragraph 2 of the pillar is, is raised before you, and so you are supposed not to give any effect to the state law of the uh, uh, state party, because that happens, of course, that is trying to escape jurisdiction. Well, you will look at the Vivendi and the Portuguese case of the uh, Tribunal Federal. Of course you will, and there, of course, this is no more uh, uh, arbitral uh, uh, jurisdiction. But at the same time, uh, when you look at whether the three-tire uh, dispute resolution process has been complied with in a FIDIC Red Book uh, 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 contract, uh, and you look at subclauses 20.4 to 20.6 of the Red Book, certainly you look at uh, arbitral precedent as maybe you have trouble to find it, but Christopher Seppela is here to, to tell you what's in there. So, well, so far, no big uh, 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 conviction. The parties. I have a state. Oh, come on. Yes, of course. And there I will disagree a little bit with uh, Diego, I think. Because, uh, yes, there is a state. But there is an increasing number of states in commercial arbitration. In all but one of the arbitrators in which it arbitrations in which I, I am s uh, sitting right now, in all but one of them, there is a state. Uh, the ICC changed its rules in 2012, of course, and introduced uh, the, uh, impliedly, the direct appointment of the uh, 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 sole arbitrator or the chair when uh, there is a state. The um, uh, 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 award will come to a plenary session of the court to be approved. Okay, so far, it's, but it's just business as usual. It's only a state. And as an arbitrator, let me submit that I do not reason in a different way when there's a state party to an arbitration pending before me as when it is only two companies. Uh, construction disputes, environmental damages, allegations, no significant impact. Uh, the investor, the second party. Well, okay, there's an investor. Uh, Treaty shopping, uh, relaxation of the jurisdictional link. What do we have in commercial arbitration? Oh, 25 years ago, we were concerned about multipartite arbitration. The first one I had in Portland, Maine in 1987, I will always remember. That was a mess. It was very difficult conceptually. Look at the 2012 ICC rules. Multi -part multiple parties and multiple contracts. Are possible. Third party financing is the question now. The insurer or a venture capitalist. Class arbitrations and mass arbitrations were the topic of, last, of this Monday's uh, annual meeting of the Institute of World Business Law. That is an entirely different world. So the parties, the, the, uh, the arbitration agreement, I don't see a diriment difference. The arbitral process, transparency, much has been said, arbitral proceedings, uh, 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 the uh, amicus curiae have found their way to arbitral tribunals and to hearings, public hearings, memorials and documentary evidence, especially in areas like mine, environmental law, uh, will enjoy full uh, support of the uh, uh, participation uh, principle, uh, the information and uh, the ORS convention, uh, and the, bi the biggest problem will be for the arbitrators to, re to, to entertain the motions to redact confidential information from those. But there's no uh, technical problem. That's, uh, uh, tr I guess, uh, true in, in both areas, even though, and I have never thought that commercial arbitration was confidential. I have been looking for the rule for the last three decades. I never found it anywhere. And so, there I will agree, but only to me it is not new, that there is no principle of confidentiality in commercial arbitration. <laughs> Corruption, general interest, those are matters. Uh, misappropriation of public funds. I had an 8 million uh, European funds misappropriation in one of my arbitrations. Do you think the arbitrator, the commercial arbitrator, sole arbitrator, deals with this lightly, lightheartedly? I don't think so. Publicity of awards, that's a problem, of course, but what do the parties do? They refer to, I said, Christopher Sepala, for example, for FIDIC uh, construction uh, uh, contract interpretation. Or they will refer to, uh, well, prior awards that they will just file into evidence. It's been done to me three or four times in the last two months. 
they will just produce prior awards to which they have been in which they have been in, in, with relating to arbitrations in which they have appeared as counsel or just that they will have obtained through social networks. Look at the uh, Emmanuel Gaillard's uh, recent piece in the Cluny on uh, um, um, sociology of arbitration, social networks. Do you have something? Yeah, I, I have an award here. It's, okay, I'll produce it. Can I produce it into evidence? Yes, but do, do cross out the names, please. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes. And I am late, I only have three minutes for my second uh, 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 qu query. Substantive aspects of the matter, three points only, so it should, well, one minute per point will be a little short, but three points I will test. Um, the subject matter of the dispute, an arguably narrower normative field, and the existence of general interest considerations. Last but best. Subject matter of the dispute, in one, on one side of the ring, I have a, an investment, on the other one, contractual obligations. Is it that different? What's the bottom line, in spite of everything that has been said this morning? There's a big commonality between the two types of arbitration, in many, I would say, in most cases. What is the claimant asking? Lost profits. Well, that's in both cases. That's true in investment, that's true in commercial arbitration. Lost profits, lost market, whatever. Uh, sometimes in commercial arbitration, and I've seen it before me, a state entity respondent is asked to be held responsible for the fact that other state entities have not extended the uh, support and facilities like authorizations and, per and permits that they were supposed to give permit to import, permit to construct, build, uh, VAT uh, franchise, and so on. And so you being the employer in a construction contract, you're responsible because your tax authorities did not refund the VAT to me. Oh, I, I will not say a word more because I have not written the award on that one yet. I will do that at Christmas. Uh, other example, other, other piece of evidence of that. Emmanuel Gaillard says, well, let's allow cross claims, uh, counterclaims uh, in, in investment arbitration. And there the difference will really fade out. Second point. Two more minutes, fine. A narrower uh, uh, normative field. Arguably, investment pro uh, protection uh, concept and rules like a direct and indirect expropriation, fair and equitable treatment, whatever, are less uh, determined than uh, uh, those national domestic uh, uh, law uh, uh, rules that are argued in commercial uh, arbitration. And I think that's a, a point uh, in favor of uh, Professor Arroyo's thesis, uh, which I support, uh, because that would uh, militate in favor of consistency in, in, the, in the interpretation, which consistency, I will take another 15 seconds on that, should be understood as meaning either you abide by the present or you explain why you don't, which is perfectly legitimate. We discussed that the other day. Uh, it's, uh, but that's, to me, that's arbitral jurisprudence. I have, and that's the, my, my American bias. I am perfectly authorized to not follow the precedent. I just have to understand that it exists and explain why. Difference. Differenti differentiation. Um, I always say French lawyers argue a contrario, Americans argue by differentiating from the uh, uh, precedent. Uh, we have many uh, recurring rules and concepts, legal issues in commercial arbitration too. Whether a dispute adjudication board decision is final and binding under subclause 20.4 of the FIDE Credit Book. That is something where, what do I look for? Except English case law, arbitral case law. That's, there are, there's nothing else available. Um, what, uh, how do I know where, at what geographical point, electricity was delivered according to such or such in term? I had to decide that. I anxiously looked for arbitral uh, precedents. There were no court precedents. I didn't find any arbitral precedent either. I had to interpret it myself. Pretentious, but that's, the, that's a fact. Uh, more documented ex examples. Prohibition of contradicting oneself to the detriment of the other party. The right to terminate the contract unilaterally. Maybe even the three or four prong test for provisional measures. 
What do we look at? Yeah, of course, we look at case law from the uh, president of the uh, uh, Luxembourg court, of the court of justice, of the tribunal. Yes, of course, it's so, so fine that it is pretty consistent with arbitral jurisprudence or state law jurisprudence. Fine, but we do look at it. Last point, I am late, general interest. Uh, well, I think that uh, investment treaties are there to protect the investor. I, I, I kind of misheard things this morning because that kind of was forgotten. And uh, um, uh, Professor Arroyo very correctly said that investment arbitration involves public matters, public policy, regulatory issues. That's on the, on the, on the part of the state action. Conversely, I think that we're here to protect the investor's rights. The investor when, was enticed into investing under representation that he would have certain warranties. And now if you're going to change the interpretation and therefore change the law, if I may put it that way, in the middle of the course of the investment, as a former business lawyer in my younger years, I will be extremely shocked. And so therefore to me, the starting point of the freeze, if you will, for uh, an inter interpretation committee is not going to be the time when the dispute arises, or, the t or even much less, of course, the time when the dispute is filed. It is when the investment is made. Sorry about that. Somebody has to be different somewhere. Uh, anyway, is, is it true that commercial arbitration ignores uh, general interest, public considerations, public policy? What do you think I did when I was there with 8 million uh, European state aids misappropriated by a party? Did I just ignore it? Could I do that? Would my award have been supported by the Paris Court of Appeals when reviewing it? Or even by the Court of Arbitration of the ICC? Of course not. It wouldn't have flown. I'm done. Uh, and to finish, I would say, my area is environmental law. Is there a, such a big difference in nature between pollution and corruption? Is environmental uh, public policy so far away from other types of public oh, Of course not. So when we are going to be asked by a state party in a commercial arbitration to hear its counterclaim for damages, for environmental damages, and I could give you the exact examples because those are real cases, of course, but I don't have no time anymore, of course we'll look at it very seriously. So where is the difference? Coherence, transparency, and accountability. Those were uh, Diego's three points. I think they're absolutely well taken, but uh, I think that uh, the bottom line, to go very fast, we need transparency because we need uh, to be able to ensure some consistency, maybe by explaining why it's not the same result. Why? Because we want to be accountable, because we want to be professionals, because we want to, be, to give the best humanly possible solution. And that is why we will look at what nos aînés have done. Sorry, I don't know how to put that in English. Sorry, I've been too long. <laughs> so thank, you. <clears throat> thank you very much for that very lively and <clears throat> yeah, to the point <clears throat> presentation. Um, as you have kindly waived your right to immediate response, the floor is open, and I might also add that I've uh, decided that we would prolong uh, that session until one o'clock. I think we've been eating into our lunch break anyway, so ten minutes more or less does not make such a difference. The gentleman in the back, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Carlo De Stefano, Bocconi University of Milan. Uh, my question is uh, for Professor Fernandez Arrojo. Um, you mentioned transparency, and um, my question is uh, whether you see a more realistic case for transparency in international commercial arbitration involving a private party and a state or um, public entity. And if yes, on which, uh, based on which legal grounds, especially if the parties have not mentioned the issue in the, in the arbitration clause or contract. I propose that we do as before that we collect two more questions from Laurence no, no. and yeah. then from Bocartes and maybe that gentleman over there and then we'll think we'll have to conclude that session. Laurence Bosson. Yeah, a short question. Uh, a lot of emphasis has been put on consistency uh, in both commercial arbitration and investment arbitration by the two panelists. Uh, and I would like to know 
why is it so important that we have consistency? I would like to ask the following question. Does one size fits all? If I look at commercial arbitration, what about party autonomy? How far does it go in investment arbitration? If I look at it from the domestic perspective, we have different courts, administrative tribunals, civil courts, and they apply different proceedings. Why is it different at the international level? Thank you. Now the gentleman over there, please. Uh, yes, hello, Radio Radovic from the University of Luxembourg. Uh, my question goes to Professor Tiafri. Uh, can you clarify your position on the mutual um, influence between commercial arbitration and um, investment arbitration? Because as you said in the beginning of your speech, uh, same interest is in stake. So in both arbitrations, they actually want to cover the loss. That's actually the reason why commercial uh, lawyers always want to say something about investment arbitration. Uh, but you also yourself said that if you were an attorney and a tribunal would actually change the law during the, the, during the arbitration, you would be shocked. Now, you also raised many times the FIDIC arbitration, which is, it's, uh, recently was extremely alive in terms of tribunals deciding what a claim could be at <coughs> all, uh, what award, awards uh, a tribunal can render, and so on. So bearing this in mind, can I actually clarif uh, clarify whether commercial influence, if any, on investment arbitration as a completely different branch of law is something good or bad, according to you? Thanks. So, oh, thank you for your questions, Professor Fernandez Arroyo, please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, a short comment uh, on the Jeffrey's speech. Um, I have several things, but I think it's, it's better to address to, to the public. Uh, but uh, only one thing, I totally agree. I totally agree that arbitration issues are different, and, and therefore uh, they have they, they must be taken differently regarding the, the, the relevance or the significance of uh, jurisprudence. Of course, there is not the same, as, as you correctly pointed out, um, competence, competence, and a particular factual uh, element. And going to, to commercial arbitration, in a research made... Uh, con or conducted uh, uh, some years ago by, by Gabriel Kaufman Kohler, the conclusion in, in commercial arbitration and the use of president, the conclusion was, well, finally, uh, commercial arbitrators uh, do what they can. So they, they are not uh, really paying too much uh, attention to, to uh, presidents. But they, uh, she mentioned in, 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 the, in that article um, around 15% uh, of cases in which uh, commercial arbitrators uh, had uh, uh, indeed paid attention to precedents. And I think that is, uh, we can say that 15% is not so much, but within the content, I, I think it's quite significant for two reasons. The, the, the first reason is that in commercial arbitration, the, the, the knowledge of previous cases is uh, still difficult, so that is a, a, a point on, on relativity in, uh, about this 15%. And the second issue is the very um, um, way in which uh, arbit uh, commercial arbitration uh, presents to the arbitrators. In many cases of commercial arbitration, for those, all those here, to uh, have experience in commercial arbitration, in many cases the problem is a problem of fact. Is it if the machine works or, um, uh, correctly or not, or if the, the, the deadline for the um, provision was respected or not, etc., of the conformity of the goods. So um, that you don't need really much jurisprudence for that. It's a matter of fact and you need maybe experts to say if this machine is working rightly or not. And maybe this 15% of cases is, are the cases um, regarding 
merits or very important aspect of procedure. And so maybe that 15% is very significant indeed in commercial arbitration. And the, the coming to, to the questions of the uh, attendance, uh, um, grazie Carlo mm, per la tua domanda. This is uh, uh, if we have a case for transparency in commercial arbitration, including if I uh, understood currently, uh, um, um, including uh, commercial arbitration involving a state. And I, I argue that there, there is several uh, arguments for, for transparency in commercial arbitration. But maybe the, the main uh, reason is that it exists a de facto situation of prevailing almost exclusive jurisdiction of arbitration in, in particular in, in big commercial transnational cases. And mm, taking this into account, that is to say, if, if we realize that arbitration is um, now the, the owner of the, the golden share of transnational litigation, uh, that makes arbitration more accountable. You need to, uh, that it's not um, <coughs> insignificant for the general of the population and for lawyers and for the states, uh, how and why the law, in particular transnational law, uh, and also, mm, and maybe more importantly, domestic law, is being interpreted in a manner or in another manner. That is not uh, without relevance. It is very important because if you think that, according to some surveys, uh, around 85 or 90 percent of transnational commercial cases are solved right now by means of arbitration, that is, we are not talking about uh, with was the case 20 or 30 years ago of an exception or just uh, an option for, for uh, big uh, companies. It's the rule. And so we need to know what arbitrators are doing with rules. And, and that is for, even for the, the legal expectation for future cases. So we need to know. And for that reason, I am uh, totally in favor of the publication of awards and not only summaries or, or excerpts that the, mm, several institutions made, complete awards, including name of arbitrators, and with all the caveats, necessary caveats for, for uh, the, the problem of confidentiality, etc. That is as heavy from a procedural point of view, I know, and I am experiencing that right now in an arbitration, it's very heavy, but I, I am ready to pay that price, even if I am not well going to, to, to be pay more for that, but I think it's very important the reason to do it. And the, the, just one word uh, to answer Laurence. Why consistency? There are many arguments, but I think uh, it's related to the same uh, elements I, I mentioned uh, concerning uh, transparency. But there is another one. Uh, now, several important and several key scholars are arguing in favor of uh, the, the arbitration as an uh, autonomous legal order. And uh, in my opinion, we cannot uh, have a, a legal order which seems to be respected as, as such, in which the impression for the public is that the decisions are taken randomly and taken in, uh, in for capricious uh, uh, people who are sitting there and we don't, don't take care of other decisions and that is um, only a matter of uh, personal uh, conviction. And for that reason, it's very important. There are many other reasons and, and legal expectations and legitimate expectations. And <coughs> at, the, at the very end is a way to uh, improve arbitration. Because as, as Patrick pointed out, um, consistency in arbitration and, and in general, I think, uh, does not mean 
uh, an uniformity that is not realistic. But if you have the, the, the obligation to look at previous cases, you, have, you, you must make an effort even to disagree. You don't need to follow always. And there are many examples in, in, in cases, and there are several really well-known as uh, SGS uh, against Philippines, talking about SGS against uh, um, Pakistan, uh, and many other examples. Well, you can disagree, of course, uh, but you need to explain. And that, I think, enhances the quality of arbitration. Yes, please. Think, I don't know if I can have two minutes, but I will limit myself to two minutes because it's very late. Uh, I will not go into the uh, French uh, autonomy of the <laughs> arbitral order because I've never believed in that, even when I was uh, speaking uh, with Pierre Meyer 35 years away. I don't, just wouldn't understand what he said. Um, but jurisdictional duty. If you're entrusted with a jurisdictional uh, mission, to settle a dispute, it seems to me that you're accountable. You're accountable to the reviewing court or body. You're accountable to the party that appointed you or not. You're accountable to ethics. You're accountable to, to yourself. To yourself. How do I sleep? If, if I, I don't. I'm a poor sleeper. I don't sleep if I've not, been, if I've not conducted myself honestly. And it's terrible when you're an arbitrator, I can tell you. Because it can be really very difficult, especially if your wife is, is one also, and then you start speaking at night. <laughs> so this is accountability. This is accountability. Now, it, it, does one size fit all? So that, that was on, on consistency. Why, why does it have to be consistent? Does one size fit all? No, 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 I didn't mean that. But you know, it's a question of intensity or quantity. It's, it's the cursor. Uh, I, what I was saying is there are not two worlds with no bridge. Uh, that was, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm, look, this is a, a topic I've been thinking about very recently. I'm not at the end of the reflection, I will never be. But no, I don't say that to, there's no different obstacle. The, if I uh, let you think that I was arguing that there was a commercial arbitration influence over in, uh, investment arbitration, I'm sorry because you're bringing a new question to me. I have not uh, uh, realized it, and so you're puzzling me, and I'm going to not sleep tonight because I'm going to try and find the answer. Yeah. <laughs> the last point is about Gabrielle uh, kaufmann Kohler's uh, 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 very interesting study, of course, where she showed that 15% uh, of commercial arbitrations did look at precedents. First of all, I think it's already, it was in 2006 or eight or something like that. It's pretty old already. So. Things may have changed. We now have masters in arbitration uh, and so on and so forth. You know, uh, but people don't do uh, conflict of laws anymore in, in arbitration. It's not fashionable anymore. <coughs> they do uh, arbitration. Huh? Uh, so maybe they've, they've learned at least uh, that uh, they may refer on uh, prior cases. But uh, what I see is an increase of that. Uh, there's a, what, I'm meaning, what I'm saying is there is an increase in, in council competence and in the aggressivity of the parties. The parties are council. Uh, uh, cases are more and more tense. There are more and more challenges of all kinds. Even the, even the secretariat of the institution is now challenged in cases. You know, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, and I think that they now don't, I mean, I don't have those cases where you're only asked to say if it was on time or not and so on and so forth. Law is always argued before me in commercial arbitration. There's, there may be a shift here. I don't have enough uh, data because we all, we're all alone on this, you know, mm -hmm. so we only have the cases that we are in front of. But maybe there's, there's a, 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 a trend here. I guess I address all questions very quickly. Well, thank you very much indeed. And, uh well, I think we've all had a lot of very interesting insights, including in the nocturnal lives of famous <laughs> arbitrators. I should <laughs> let people know about it's my all private about, life. It's like all that. about transparency, you know. And now uh, you have leverage about on me, you know. <laughs> and we'll see whether it always lives up to consistency also in that field. Anyway, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Thank you for the two of you for your very inspiring um, presentations. Thank you very much. <clears throat>